Because I want to tell you this. Most people think that the will of God is found at the mountaintop. Instead, the will of God is found in the moment that you need God the most. Mondo De La Vega, it is great to have you on Charisma Magazine Online's Beyond the Article. And today we are talking about the article that is based off of this brand new book, oh, My man. Crazy Life. And look how beautiful this is. In fact, you've got that orange couch right behind you on this. I got to uh, show you. you. Where's you that show couch? That. There's the couch. <laughs> yes. Yes. And uh, maybe later we'll talk about the story behind that couch. But uh, that's that's like later on in your crazy life. Uh, that's the good crazy. <laughs> that would be book number two. That would be book number two. Book number two. But it's, uh, it's, it's a great set piece for sure. You. It gets your attention and your story mm. gets our attention. And that's why we've written this book with you or we've, pro we've published this book with you uh, because, Mondo, your story is is quite the adventure. And we've talked a lot uh, uh, in different uh, in different areas uh, or different opportunities. And so we um, it's great to be able to, to talk about this particular aspect of your story. And so just tell me about why this book needed to be written. Wow. I, you know, this is this is unbelievable because I've always believed that life is made up of moments, great moments, difficult moments, uh, moments that can reshape your opinion, the trajectory of your future, the tra you know, even the now moments. And yeah. I feel like this book um, not only is for now, but it, this book is for a person that doesn't understand the call of God in their life the person that is frustrated with the call of God in their life and it's not going anywhere. How can God use someone like me yet? How do I see the future? How do I go into what God has for me? And I believe that sometimes in life, you have to understand what those moments look like because those moments are preparing you for what God has for you. Mm -hmm. You know, 26 years ago, this book uh, should have been written 26 years ago. The offer to write this book uh, 26 years ago from other publishers was on the table, but it was mm. at the right time. And I think when you understand the timing of God, when you understand, as a matter of fact, I'll give you this little quote that T.D. Jake said to me years ago. I'm talking about way back before, before anyone even knew T.D. Jakes and T.D. Jakes visited the Dream Center. I'm sure he won't remember me, but if he does, uh, that will be a miracle because that man meets a lot of people. But I was I was the driver. And Pastor Tommy Barnett um, had, gave, had given me that uh, mission and that, that job to pick up the guests and drive them around. Well, anyways, T.D. Jake said this, just because you're called doesn't mean that you're ready for your call. Mm. And that was a very powerful moment for me because that helped me understand just because someone gives you an offer, it doesn't mean you're ready for that offer. Today, my life is stable. I think when you understand what life looks like right now, when you understand another uh, explosion of gang members in America and what they're doing, how they're using technology and, and how we're losing people to fentanyl, how we're losing people to drugs, how we're losing people to fame, how we're losing people to almost every aspect of culture, yet this book right now seems so timely because it deals with God's promises, but it also deals with the moments in life that reshapes us. Amen. Amen. You, you said that that wasn't the right time 26 years ago for this book, but now is the right time. What was the thing that made you say this is the right time? Wow. You, you have great questions. By the way, I want to thank Charisma for believing in me. I want to thank all of your team. I want to thank, of course, you know, Steve Strang. I've been friends with Steve for almost 20 some years now. Uh, I got to meet him through Jim Baker back then. And to be on this podcast and to be a part of the family of the charisma, you know, I'll tell you a little secret has always been a dream of mine. And mm. I never thought in a million years that I would be part of that family of authors. And I'm honored to be. So listen, I think it's simple. Back then, 26 years ago, I was not stable in my ways, even mm. though I came to Christ, even though I understood that the salvation message uh, saved me, yet my life was not stable. One of my mentors, Jim Baker, has become a father of mine, has been a, a spiritual father, of course. But he told me 26 years ago, you know, you can write a book then and 
they'll want a story that is not about you. It's a story of the streets and of a story of mm-hmm. a gang member, which is fine if that's what you want to give them. He said, but you're not stable in your life right now. You're not married. You don't have kids. You haven't experienced the other side of what God has for you. And I think the powerful part is when you understand what God has for you on the other side, then the mission will be completed. I always tell people this. A lot of people want to work from God, but yet they're not stable on their ways. People Mm. want to fulfill a prophecy for their life, yet their life is not stable. The Bible says that a double-minded man, listen to this, is unstable in its ways. Either let your yes be yes or your no be no. There's a lot of maybe peoples. Maybe I'll build a ministry. Maybe I'll stay in my marriage. Maybe I'll I'll write a book. Maybe I'll sing a song. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, maybe never goes anywhere. But when Mm. you become stable in your ways, and I needed to understand that in order for God to use me in my life, I needed to learn how to be stable in my ways. A lot of people go from church to church and ministry to ministry, and they want to start a podcast, and they want to start a TV show, and then they want to be a missionary, and then they want to do this. And they never stay on one location long enough for God to use them there. And listen, I had to learn to stop for a moment and intake and receive a download from God and learn how to be patient with myself, learn Mm -hmm. how to be stable with myself, learn what it was to be in a place of stability long enough that when God wanted to use me, I will have roots. Uh Uh-oh, you're going to get me preaching, John. (laughs) (laughs) That's the short version. Yeah. So you feel like there is that stability now. And I'm sure it, it, it could have been written a couple of years ago because you, you've been stable for as long as I've known you. <laughs> and uh, but we're so grateful that you've you've been able to write this book with us now. There's there's a, a, a part in this uh, in this. We took out a quote from the article, which is in the book. that says, I was fearing hope. This mm-hmm. fear was foreign and shook me to the core. Wow. Let's talk about that, what it means to fear hope and how now hope is a, a part of the core of who you are. You know, when I was growing up in the gang and I was developing my ways in the gang, they reminded me every single day not to make plans past 18 years old. That'll shake you to your core because when when you can't see past 18 years old, you can't see yourself as a father. You can't see yourself as the future. You can't see yourself being old. You can't. Therefore, you live your life at a fast pace with such an adrenaline rush, which I called survival mode. If I can just survive through the day, I'm okay. Yet the, the thing I feared the most was the fear of the unknown of what hope looked like. The, the, the fear, listen, I, had, I never was fearful of getting in a fight in the gang. Mm. I was never afraid to go to prison. I was never, never afraid to even dying. But what I feared the most was the hope that there was a, a better day. I, I was afraid of peace. I was afraid of love. I was afraid of, of having a relationship with someone. I was afraid of, of even understanding what life can look like with hope because my identity had become the streets. The gang culture had become so ingrained in me that I couldn't see past what they were telling me. And then on the other side, you had society telling me, lock them up and throw the key away. So Mm. the fear of hope overwhelmed me because what would my life look like without all those around me with the survival mode? And yet today I reached a place in my life that I found stability and peace and peace of mind and being hopeful and being around men and women of God that have had the faith. You know, I love hanging out with old timers because old timers will tell you this will pass. It's mm. going to be OK. Just stay stable. Just stay humble. Just pray. Just trust God. And yet the problems, the problems still remain. The same yeah. problems from yesterday are still here today. But my hope is different, you know. So understanding what hope looked like uh, really scared me. Maybe it didn't scare a lot of people, but it scared me because I didn't know who I was going to become. And that, my, my friend, is something that when you understand that when you can't see beyond what you, you're able to see, that's when faith, hope, and love come in. And Amen. it changes the way you think. It changes the way you carry yourself. It changes the way you speak. It changes the ability to understand 
that I need to learn to trust in God. Amen. Amen. You're preaching, brother. That's really good. <laughs> you know, there, there came a point in your life where hope broke through. And it was really a catalyst for that was three questions that your sister asked you. So we got to talk about this because this oh, is a man. pivotal moment in your story. Tell me what those questions were and tell me what your answers are. You know, I got to I got to set the stage because a few weeks before, even months before and hours before my life could have been gone. My life was on the line. Death was stalking me. Death was surrounding me. Every time I went out, everywhere I went, death was always it felt like the spirit of death was just coming over me and people were dying and my best friends were dying in my arms and drive-by shootings. And it got to a point where the streets of L.A. got so dark at one moment that we didn't know who was going to make it through the day. Yet I began to lose hope. I began to ask questions. Is this it? Is this mm -hmm. all we have left? The money's not enough. The low riders are not enough. The reputation, the respect, the retaliation, the, the threats, the, it's not enough. Yet, when my sister walked in, she walked in and risked her life. Listen to this. She risked her reputation. And this is why a lot of people are afraid to step into someone else's world because we're afraid. Yet, when God gives you a call... You have to be able to step into that call. My sister was able to do that, and she delivered three of the most powerful phrases at that moment that was the catalyst. One, what if God is real? Two, what if prayer works? And this one got me. What if you have a different destiny? Mm -hmm. That changed the way I began, and it began to hunt me. It began to, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, John, but those three phrases began to hunt me because I begin to shift something in me, not realizing that God's timing was meeting me. Again, death was stalking me, but at the same time, life was chasing me. Yeah. So if you were to be asked those questions today, obviously the answers are different, but tell me like, tell me what those answers would be today. Like how would you articulate that today? Kind of as you, as you similarly have just done, but like, Obviously, that was different back then. But yeah. Like, yeah, I think, you know, John, I, mm -hmm. I think those three phrases and those three questions haven't changed. I think people are wondering, what if God is real? Yeah. And I think people want to know, what if prayer does work? You know, people get upset when a shootout happens. And, and by the way, there was a horrible shootout yesterday, a shooting in, in Kansas City, Missouri. Yeah. You know, and, and when people begin to say, well, don't pray for me, do something about it. You know, mm. so people are wondering, well, pr if prayer works, then where is it? We want to see it in, in action. And then what if, what if I have a different destiny? I think we're all looking for purpose in life. People on Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and social media has allowed us to see that inside of everyone is looking for a purpose. Everyone is looking for a sense of destiny. Everyone wants to know do I have a plan for my life? There's five courses you can get right now for $2.99 mm -hmm. to find out what your destiny is. Yet everyone still, the question hasn't changed. I think the, the, the environment and, of course, the culture has changed. But those three questions has never changed because we're still asking the same question. What if God is real? Where is he at? Is, is, mm -hmm. if, it's God, if God is real, I want to see a miracle. And if, if God, you know, if I communicate with God through prayer, then I got a few things I need to talk to him about because I'm a bit frustrated with my sexuality. I'm a bit frustrated with my relationships. So people are starting to ask those questions. But the key is this. Jeremiah 29, 11 is so key for now. And it was the key back then for me. It has been the key through my process and it has been the key till this day. And that is for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I don't have to continue with that scripture. I can just end with the fact that someone had a plan for me. Mm. And a lot of people today don't understand that they have a destiny. They don't understand that they have a purpose, let alone who has a plan for them. It seems like no one has a plan for the city of Chicago. Yeah, we're helping people. We're feeding people. There's great ministries, great nonprofits there. But at the same time, 
Does anybody have a plan on how to stop the murders in Chicago with the gang culture? Does anybody have a plan for the border? Does anybody have a plan for immigration? So we're starting to ask all these questions, yet they haven't changed, John. They're the same mm. as it was you know, 20 some years ago is the same questions now, yet the answer is still Jesus. The answer is still the scripture, which is the Bible. The answer is still the church. I believe in the church. I believe the church is, has and always will be a hospital for hurting people. Hmm. You know, brother, as you're talking about this, you know, those questions remain the same. The, the fact that those questions are still are, are always there. But I think the reason that people don't ask them of themselves is because of apathy, is because we're just complacent. Um, and so it's when people start asking these questions that there can be change. And yeah. so your sister was the one that asked you these questions. And so as people are reading this book, I'm believing that they're going to be asking God those questions. They're going to be asking themselves these questions. And they're going to, as you said, Jeremiah 29, 11 is so important because if we look at it in the context of Jeremiah, they're, the children of Israel are going into captivity, yeah. but God still has a plan for them. So even though they're heading into something that's dark, God still has a path for redemption for them. And God had a great path and plan for redemption for you because you went from a gangster to you made mention of being at the Dream Center after coming to Christ, and that's where you met a powerful man of God that your life has changed because of that. And I want to get to the point where you write in chapter 21 that when God laughed, and I want to hear about <laughs> some of those good things because we talked about the gangster, we talked about yeah. you know the, the, the questions your sister asked, but tell me about when God laughs. Oh my goodness! That you're you're fast forward. As a matter of fact, what's so funny about you saying that? Yesterday, I finished recording the audio book for this book. How fun! And I could. And the reason why it took me several days is because the, when I got to the chapter of when God laughed, I cried and I couldn't stop crying because when I was growing up, everyone knew around me. I never wanted to have kids. I never wanted to get married. My homeboys, which is my friends, were getting, you know, they were getting married and having kids all over the place. And I'm thinking, how can a good father be absent in a kid's life? And then I couldn't see myself as a father. Kids around me made me anxious and make me claustrophobic. <laughs> kids around me, just I just didn't want to be, just the thought of being a father scared me because I didn't know what a father looked like. I didn't know what a father smelled like. I didn't know what a father sounded like. So for me to even include myself in that category, it scared everything about me. I fell in love with this girl. And the funny thing about that is in, in one of the chapter, who's that girl? I talk about on the first date, I tell her three things. One, uh, I'm never getting married. Two, I'm never getting married to a Mexican girl. And number three, I'm never having kids. What a charmer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yet this girl said, well, that's too bad for you because I'm getting married. I'm Mexican-American and I am having kids. Let's find out where this goes, you know? <laughs> that yeah. challenged me and, 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 and it brought me to a place to even think for one moment, you know what? What would my life look like if I was a husband? Mm. That's one thing. Number two, my wife said, uh, I want to have kids. And as soon as we got married, we began to try. And I told her, listen, you can get pregnant once. Another charming moment. <laughs> <laughs> like if I can control the idea of someone getting pregnant, right? And someone years ago said, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Here yeah. I'm trying to manipulate, trying to corral trying to figure out how to how to contain the idea that you can only get pregnant once well god laughed because my wife did get pregnant once with twins <laughs> <laughs> you got that double blessing a double blessing but the the reason why i started crying when i read that and, and i don't want to expose too much of it but I, I just tell you this when my wife had a difficult pregnancy mm. she had to be in the hospital for 70 some days Oh, and we almost lost the twins. 
But anytime I used to come over and see her, my wife would ask me to put my head on her belly. And she said, talk to them. Mm. John, I was so afraid of being a father that I couldn't say, hi, guys, this is your dad. When I met, when, when I leaned over, I said, hi, Mila, hi, Mateo, this is Mondo. Over and over again until my wife said, you know, it's okay to say your dad. Hmm. And I said, I can't. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to, to, to know what that is. I'm afraid. And you have to read the book to find out how, to, how I became, uh, the, have the ability to have the courage to say, I'm your father. And it happened at the most critical moment at the birth of my son. My son was born. Well, I, I shouldn't tell you. You need to read the book and, <laughs> and get the book right now because it's going to touch your heart in a way. Because I want to tell you this. Most people think that the will of God is found at the mountaintop. Mm. Instead, the will of God is found in the moment that you need God the most, in the moment Amen. of crisis. You know, that the people of Israel, when they were in their crisis moment and Egypt was falling on them and, and Pharaoh was coming after them, and the only thing they can do is escape and trust in a God they'd never seen, a God that they never heard, a God that had never had an experience with them like this. Yet in that crisis moment, God delivers a word to say, I'm getting out of you, I'm getting you out of Egypt and I'm taking you to the promised land. You had to go by faith. Is it in this it's in the crisis moment that God's voice is louder than anything that surrounds you? That was my moment. Is that when I heard God's voice to say, it's okay to call yourself a father, a dad, was at that critical, pivotal moment when my son was fighting for his life. Hmm. You know, Mondo, that gave me chills as you were talking about that. And I know that there are people that are watching this or listening to this and they've read the article and they're going to get the book. Go to mycharismashop.com. You can get the, get the book there or anywhere books are sold, really. But... Mondo, so there's something that I'm going to ask you to pray in just a moment for our for our wonderful audience. You know, the, it's the voice of the Father mm -hmm. that so many people were missing. It is the 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 direction, the leading of the Father. You know, Jesus teaches us to pray by saying, "Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name." You know, speaking about God as our Father, but as you described in this story you had a hard time with your earthly father um, yeah. based off of what you talked about and what we've talked about in other times as well. And therefore you had a time, you had a difficult time saying, this is your dad. You know, there's that thing about the father heart of God that people are just disconnected with. And because they're disconnected with that, they don't have that purpose that we talked about in Jeremiah 29, 11. Would you just pray for a breaking over that, that thing that's keeping people from experiencing God as the father and having that purpose in their life. Absolutely. It'd be my honor. Listen, I know you're scared. I know you're nervous. I know it seems awkward. I know it feels like something that is out of this world, something that you can't connect with. But if you knew how much God loves you, you would understand how crazy he is about you, that he loves you just the way you are. You don't have to change for him. He's not interested in your change right now. He wants to make things right with you. The change happens later. But when you are embraced with a love that is so unconditional, do you understand that God doesn't judge you? God understands the place that you've been hurt. And I want you to know something. His words are not your father's words. His actions are not your father's actions. He doesn't leave you and walk away just like your father did. He doesn't beat you and abuse you physically, mentally, spiritually, the way you have been done before. If you knew how much he loves you, you would understand that you are the best thing that ever happened in this world for him. That he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you so you can feel valued and so you can be valued, so you can understand that there's a plan for your life. And I want to pray this prayer for you. Father, wherever this person is watching and hearing my voice from, 
I pray that an overwhelming peace was just surround them. That a love that is unconditional, the way that love surrounded me and wrapped its arms around me to let me know that it was okay to hurt, that it was okay to be in pain, that it was okay to be where I was, that it was okay just to be that person that I, I couldn't pretend to be anymore. Father, I pray for stability in their heart, in their thoughts, and I pray that you would just allow them to see and understand and feel that as a father, you're there to protect them, guide them, be with them, grow with them, and cheer for them and triumph with them. But also you're there to discipline them. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the peace and love that I felt 26 years ago is the same peace and love and acceptance for who I was at that moment that they can feel right now that it's going to be okay, that no matter what is happening around them, that no matter what is happening around them right now, that everything is going to be okay. I mm. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Mondo, it's always great to be able to talk with you. And this time talking about the book, yes. My Crazy Life, and the article <laughs> in, in March's issue of Charisma Magazine online. And uh, Mondo, thank you so much for allowing us to go beyond the article uh, and to talk more about your life. And brother, we are grateful that we were able to partner with you to get this story out. I'm God grateful for Charisma and everyone there. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. From 1975, Charisma has been at the forefront of reporting on revival, miracles, and the move of God in our world. Charisma Magazine is now going exclusively online to reach beyond the physical barriers of a print issue. Charisma Magazine Online is committed to bringing you the very best spirit-led content to inspire your walk with God in this upside-down world. Go to mycharisma.com for exclusive content today.